Okay. I'm sure, as you all remember from Lecture 9, we used the Berry-Essan theorem to do some calculations, which is uh, a form of the central limit theorem, which has error bounds. So I stated a slightly different version than what we used, but uh, you know, there's little variations that will crop up. So the general setting is you have uh, a bunch of independent random variables, x1 through xn. And for normalization, you can uh, easily assume that they have mean 0. And let's just call their variance, the variance of the ith one, sigma i squared. And also, again, by normalization, you can assume that the sum of all the variances is 1. Uh, in this, uh, for today, I'm going to throw in this extra condition that they all have third moment equal to 0. That would be satisfied if they're symmetric random variables, like xi has the same distribution as minus xi. Uh, this, is re this is not actually really important, and we could just drop it, but uh, I'll keep it for notational simplicity, essentially. Okay, and so this theorem is about what happens if you add up all these random variables. It gives you a new random variable called S. And uh, the central limit of the theorem suggests that, let's say under most circumstances, you would hope that S has a, a distribution which is close to that of a, a normal distribution, a Gaussian. And in particular, it should be close to the normal distribution which has the same mean and variance as S. Uh, and of course, the mean of S is 0, and the variance of uh, S is 1 by this assumption. So we can hope that S is close to the standard normal, Z. Um, and so that's what the Barry SN theorem says. Uh, well, I'm going to fill in exactly what I mean by this closeness in a second. Uh, but the error is um, basically given by constant times this quantity beta, which is the sum over uh, i from 1 to n of the fourth moments of the xi's. Okay, so if you remember, way back to lecture 9, what we really used, we dropped this condition. Instead of this, we had the expected value of the absolute value of xi cubed. But it's kind of all the same. Uh, as I said, I just uh, used this version because it jives, it's going to jive with our notion of a reasonable random variable. Okay. Uh, now, you might ask, uh, you know, this is a bit hard to get used to, like, it doesn't even, it's not even clear whether this beta looks like a small number or not. Like, ideally, if s and z are supposed to be close, then this beta should be small. So here's the standard way with, uh, by which you would try to bound beta and say that, indeed, it is like a small number. So um, if, furthermore, all the xi's are b reasonable, this was this notion we invented earlier of having a fourth moment bounded by some constant times square of second moment, then, of course, that means beta uh, is at most some i goes from 1 to n of b times the expected value of xi squared squared. Okay, and the xi's of mean 0, so this uh, second moment is the same as the variance, which is sigma i squared. So this is uh, beta times sum of sigma i to fourth. Okay, and we'll do a familiar trick, we'll pull out uh, x, uh, sigma i squared as a max, and then also leave the rest of the sigma i squared in as a sum. So this is uh, at most b times the max over i of sigma i squared times the sum of sigma i squared, which is 1 by assumption. Okay, so think of uh, b as being some small constant. Then uh, this beta is upper bounded by, you know, a constant times the maximum of the variances. Which, you know, if all the exercises are similar, we might even hope is something like 1 over n. Okay, but in general, uh, you know, it says if these random variables are not completely crazy, and this, some assumption like this is necessary to get a central limit theorem, then s is close to z, provided somehow none of the xi's is dominating in terms of variance. Okay. Um, yeah, so for a typical example that we might think of, is if uh, xi is ai times xi, where this little xi is a random plus or minus one bit, like always, and these are numbers. Um, and we may assume that sum of ai squared is 1 for normalization. And then this, theorem, this satisfies all the hypotheses, mean 0, uh, third moment 0, and it's uh, 1 reasonable. So we got that... Uh, the error in this theorem is just like the b, or in fact 1, times the maximum of the ai squareds. Okay, so if all of the coefficients are small, then sum of ai xi should look like a Gaussian. Okay, so now this uh, theorem statement has some quotation marks in it, which means it's not really a proper theorem statement. 
So let's revisit this issue of what exactly it means for two random variables to be close. So actually, as we discussed back in lecture nine, um, you know, the most typical thing in like a probability textbook would be to say that two random variables are close if their CDFs are close at every point. Um, but sometimes you want more than that. Like when we actually use this, we wanted that the expected absolute value of these random variables were close. You can't actually deduce that immediately knowing the closeness of the CDF distance. So let's, uh, well, actually, I brought this up last time, but let's revisit it again. What exactly one might mean by saying that two random variables are epsilon close. And the uh, idea that's a bit more general than saying that um, their CDFs are close point-wise is to say that if you look at some test function, psi, then it's expect the expected value of psi under S is approximately, let me say just up to epsilon here, uh, equal to the expected value of this test function at z. Okay, where psi is some, um, I don't know, nice, or maybe even you want, let's say, for all nice test functions, psi that map r into r. Okay, so in statistics you might call it a test function, in like computer science, like cryptography, you might call this like a distinguisher, you know, some test that's trying to distinguish between these two random variables S and Z, and we would say that S and Z are close, they're kind of indistinguishable if, you know, nice test functions cannot distinguish them. So this captures the notion of closeness, um, especially as you look at different size. So the standard one with CDF distance is about the class of all size that look like uh, step functions, okay? So let me draw the graph of some function psi. Okay, maybe here's r. This is zero. This is one. This is some point mu, maybe. Okay, so that's a, a function psi. It's like a zero, one step function. And so if we took psi, that psi in this definition, it would say like exactly the probability that s is less than or equal to u is approximately the probability that z is less than or equal to u. Okay, so if this closeness held with this psi, then, you know, that would say like the, the CDF of these two guys are close at u. Okay, and, you know, and the other uh, thing we discussed when we were using this back in lecture nine was the psi, which is the absolute value function. This is another potential psi you might care about, whose graph looks like this. And if these things were close under that psi, it would really mean that, you know, the the L1 norm, or the first absolute moment of S, was close to that of Z. That's also something you might like to have out of two similar random variables. Okay, and we're going to prove the Berriasian theorem today, or some kind of variant on it. And we're going to choose a, actually neither of these nice functions, but we're going to choose a big class of nice functions to prove the Berriasian theorem for. Okay, so when you get around to trying to prove the very SAM theorem, uh, there's a little analysis involved. And for that reason, it's nice to try to prove it for, let's say, uh, functions psi that are nice in the calculus sense. So in the calculus sense, maybe the nicest functions are maybe all C infinity, you know, infinitely differentiable psi. Okay, so you might try to... Uh, you know, prove the Berriasian theorem with, let's say, any such psi as your notion of a test function. Um, actually, that doesn't look so great because, like, neither of these functions are smooth. In fact, this one is not even continuous. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. But you know, if you could prove, if you could prove the Berriasian theorem for all these smooth functions, that would be a pretty good start, at least. Does this make sense so far? Any questions? Um, can anybody say, well, we're not going to be able to, let's say, prove the Berriasian theorem with this notion of closeness for, like, every smooth function psi? Well, think about this uh, scenario, even when all the AIs are, let's say, 1 over root n. Okay, so you're adding up a bunch of plus or minus 1s. 
that's a discrete random variable. This s is a discrete random variable, and z is like a continuous random variable. So there's some senses in which s and z are not close, right? For example, s is supported, OK, forget the 1 over root n. Just say it was plus or minus 1s. S is supported on the integers, but like z has probability 0 on the integers because it's like a discrete set. So there are some senses in which they're not close. In particular, if you took, let's say this is your picture of your psi that you want to take. Say these are the integer points. You could take a psi that sort of looked like this. Uh, actually, maybe I should make this really tall. Okay, you could make such a, a function and you could ensure that it was smooth. Imagine, you know, these are really peaked. And for a random variable that's discrete and concentrated on these integer points, you know, the expected value of psi of s might be, I don't know, 1 if you arrange for the, the peaks to be about as tall as they are not wide. Um, on the other hand, you know, since a Gaussian is continuous, it's not really concentrated on these points and you could make the right hand side go to 0. Okay, so you cannot actually prove this for any C infinity test function. Uh, but what we'll prove it for is any one whose derivatives are not too crazy. And that's a relatively reasonable thing to try to do. You see, this function is going to have like super high derivatives. Okay, so the following uh, oops, statement is a little bit technical and maybe a little scary looking, but it's not, it's not so bad. So we're going to... Uh, try to prove this Berry-Essian theorem for a pretty big class of test functions. I'm going to prove it for all, okay, let me leave that there, all functions psi uh, such that, this looks a little weird, but uh, its fourth derivatives are, you know, bounded by c everywhere. Okay, c is some constant. Okay, so we're going to prove it for all smooth functions, you know, whose fourth derivatives are at most 100, like everywhere on the real line. Okay, so this rules out like super crazy functions that go up and down really fast. Okay, and actually, if this doesn't matter, but you don't even need C infinity, it can be C4. Okay, and what we're actually going to prove, the C is like a parameter. What we're going to prove, you know, when I say, quote unquote, O of beta close there, Okay, we're going to prove actually more specifically that the expected value of psi of s minus the expected value of psi of z is at most uh, O of c times beta. Okay, and this O is like, I don't know, I think it's going to be one-sixth or something. So now we have only absolute constants everywhere. Okay, so the error is actually going to depend on c. If you make c 600, then this will be 100 beta. Okay, so actually, this is a statement that I want to spend most of the class proving. And um, you'll see the connection to Boolean functions towards the end. Uh, but hasn't arrived yet. You can just think of finally seeing a, you know, a proper proof of the central limit theorem. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, actually, if you really wanted a proper proof of the central limit theorem, you would, I guess you would want this. And uh, this is the part they always skip when they do the proof of the central limit theorem in undergrad, right? They say that if the moment generating functions of two random variables, like if one approaches the other one as n goes to infinity, then the random variables just have to have closed CDFs, but they do not say why that's the case. Uh, okay, but so we're going to get a pretty good theorem that, you know, tells us something about the error for any function with bounded fourth norms. And if you want this, then you just do like a hack. Um, so, if you want to get co collusion about closeness under this functional, then you just say, well, let me construct a function which is smooth and it looks like this. You know, it's one, and then I like smoothen it out, and then it's zero out here, and maybe the width of this interval is delta. Okay, let me call that psi twiddle sub delta. Okay, so, um, 
you know, this thing has to go from 0 to 1 in an interval over a range delta. So its first derivative is probably around 1 over delta. And so its second derivative is probably around 1 over delta squared. Third and uh, fourth. So its fourth derivative will probably be around uh, 1 over delta to the fourth. Okay, and I, I assure you that you can construct a function which is smooth and looks like this and has fourth derivatives. Oops. At most, 1 over delta to the fourth. So you'll get like one source of error. You'll apply this theorem with that psi twiddle sub delta, and you'll get like error 1, which is roughly O of 1 over delta to the fourth times beta. Okay, because your C will be like 1 over delta to the fourth. And you'll get like another source of error because this function is really not the same as this function, but they differ on an interval of width delta. And the probability that a Gaussian falls into an interval of width delta is like about delta, or of delta at most. So without going into all the details there, you'll get another error that's about O of delta. Okay, now you can just balance these by choosing your favorite delta. So if you take delta to be beta to the um, one-fifth, then the overall error will be beta to the one-fifth. Okay, so, you know, a polynomial factor among friends is not a big deal. Okay, that was a little aside. I didn't really do it completely properly, but that shows you, you know, how it's more or less enough to get a central limit type statement for a big class of functions like this. Any questions? Okay. So now we're going to try to prove this theorem. Um, yeah, there's about three, or let's say at least th three different proofs of the central limit theorem that I know. One is like the standard one, which uses, let's say, characteristic functions and like the real Fourier analysis, you know, the ones with real numbers. Uh, there's another one called Stein's method, which I don't really know. And then the w there's the method that I'm going to show you today, which is called replacement method, which I like very much because uh, for two reasons. One, it's like very flexible. As you see, like once we finish proving this, we can get all sorts of extensions very easily using the same proof. And two, because it's really, I feel like how like a computer science or most especially like a cryptographer would prove this theorem. So let's see why that is. Um, yeah, so we're trying to show that two random variables are somehow indistinguishable, at least to this big class of test functions. So one of them is x1 plus dot, 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 plus xn. Okay, and the other one is uh, just z, a standard Gaussian. So it's not clear what you should do. You see, if you just state things in a slightly different way, then I, I, I claim that actually it becomes quite clear what you should do. So somehow I feel like this statement with s on one hand and z on the other hand is not stated the right way. Instead, you should not look at z, but you should look at z1 plus dot, 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 dot plus zn, where the zi is a normal with mean zero and variance sigma i squared. Okay, and the zi should be independent too. Now, in fact, as we know, the sum of independent normal random variables is normal, and the variance is just sum. So what is this z1 plus dot 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 zn? It's a Gaussian with mean zero and variance equal to the sum of the variances, which is one. Okay, so this this new sum, z1 through zn, is just z. I mean, it's the same thing. Okay, but when you look at z this way, now it looks sort of nicer. You're comparing x1 through xn versus z1 through zn. I mean, the sums. Okay, and having done that, then, uh, you know, the idea, the basic idea behind the proof is to use, like, a, what you may call a hybrid argument. Or this is the replacement argument. You just start from this random variable and change the random variables inside it one at a time. Change this x1 to z1, then change x2 to z2, and so forth. And you get a sequence of like n plus 1 random variables that are like hybridizing between these two things, and you show just that the change in each step is like only a little bit. Okay? And um, that will prove the theorem. Okay, in fact, once you phrase it like this, 
uh, you don't even really need Gaussians anymore. Okay, in fact, the only thing that's really used in the central limit theorem that has anything to do with Gaussians at all is this one fact that, well, okay, one slight more fact, but the fact that the sum of Gaussians are Gaussian. What I'm saying is actually that it's not important that these z's, z1 through zn, are Gaussians. In fact, they can be any random variables that have the same means and variances as the x size. I mean, pairwise. So in fact, here's like a, essentially a stronger statement than this Barry SN theorem that is what we'll prove. I'll call this degree one invariance theorem. And I'll say why invariance is in the name in a second. Okay, so here it is. Uh, let x1 through xn and also y1 through yn be independent random variables. Okay, uh, and let me say with matching first, second, and third moments. Okay, and what I mean by that is uh, the expected value of xi equals the expected value of yi. Okay, let me put to the k, let me put to the j, to the j for uh, j equals 1, 2, and 3, and i from 1 up to n. Okay, so these random variables kind of look the same up to the first three moments. And let's add each of them up. So let me write Sx for sum of Xi's, that's a random variable, and Sy for sum of Yi's, that's a random variable. These are both i going from 1 to n. And let's take this weird condition, let uh, psi, this is our class of test functions, be a function such that uh, its fourth derivatives are bounded by some c. Then, uh, Sx and Sy kind of look the same to psi. Okay, I'll put even a right constant in here, uh, 1 over 24 times C times beta XY. Well, let me define beta XY. Beta XY is just the sum over I of expected value of XI to fourth plus expected value of YI to fourth. Uh, okay, so this is the, the theorem that I want to spend some time proving. Any questions about it? Uh, similar to what I was saying here about this, you know, third moment being zero is kind of just for notational fun. Uh, similarly, we don't really need them to have matching third moments if we instead make this error, like use expected absolute value of xi to third and expected absolute value of yi to third. Okay. Um, so why do I call this an invariance theorem? It kind of says the following. If you're like summing up a bunch of random variables n and looking at independent random variables and looking at the random variable you get, the distribution of that random variable, which is the sum, is kind of invariant to the, with respect to the distributions of the individual components. Okay, somehow as long as, you know, if you fix some first, second, and third moments, as long as you stick in, you know, for the xi or the yi, like a random variable with those first, second, and third moments, the distribution you get on the sum is about the same. Okay, so you can just change between any random variables which has the same first, second, and third moments. And as I said, even the third moment is not really necessary, so. Just um, the distribution on a sum really only depends on the first and second moments of the individual random variables.
Okay, in particular, you could take, uh, if you have one set of random variables, x1 through xn, you can take Gaussian random variables, y1 through yn, let's say, which have the same means and variances, and you'll get that the distribution of the sum of the x's is close to the distribution of the sum of the y's. But if the y's are Gaussian, the sum of the y's is just another Gaussian. Okay, so that's how, in fact, we can get this conclusion about the Berry-Essan theorem. Actually, I sort of skipped one thing here there, so let me just do it a bit more carefully. How do we get the Barry SEN statement as a corollary? Well, as I said, just take you know the yi to be Gaussian with mean zero and sigma i squared. Okay, so if you're in the hypothesis of this uh, theorem apply this theorem with these as uh, the yi's. Okay, and these will have matching zero, sorry, first, second, and third moments as the xi's because all well, Gaussians have mean and third moment zero and you fix the variance. Actually, there's still one unclear part about how this follows from this. Can somebody tell me what it is? be able to tell just by like, you know, plugging it in and seeing that there is a mismatch. Data? Yes. Data. Yes, that's right. Uh, here, the error we are getting out is like the sum of these things. And it looks like the term with the Gaussian is just somehow like went away in this error. Right? This only has the x fourth moments and the error you get actually has the y's fourth moments too. So what happened? Uh, well, what happened is, okay, if you plug Gaussians into this theorem, you indeed get this term, expected value of the Gaussian, yi to the fourth. But, um, you see, in this case, let's look at the fourth uh, norm of yi, so the fourth root of the fourth moment. If f is a Gaussian, or if, sorry, if yi is a Gaussian, then this is some particular number, three to the one-fourth times the two norm of the Gaussian. Okay, this is just because if you have a Gaussian, uh, let's say with variance one, then the expected fourth power of it is three. I remember Misha told us this last time in like lecture nine. Um, and then you have the scale and variance. So I mean the, the fourth root of the fourth norm or fourth moment is like three to the one fourth times the two norm. That's a fact about Gaussians. Um, but by assumption, this thing, this is really just a the same as xi two norm, okay? Because these are both the standard deviation, xi and yi by like construction or definition of the same means and variances and means and second moments. Uh, okay, and norms are uh, increasing, so this is at most three to the one fourth times the four norm of xi. Okay, which is to say that uh, the expected value of yi to the fourth is at most three times the expected value of xi to the fourth. Okay, so in this term, when you have an expected value of yi to the fourth, you can just say it's at most three times expected value of xi to the fourth. Okay, so you get the same thing by losing a factor of four. Okay, this is actually just a consequence of the fact that Gaussians are about the most reasonable random variables there are. So x is never going to be like that much more unreasonable than a Gaussian. Okay. Uh, by the way, the proof of this thing, yeah. can it be extended to say that if the first three moments are matching, then the error term will be in the last moment? Yes. Uh, yeah, you will see that from the proof. Yeah, and that's in fact why you actually you'll see from the proof that really you could have just, it would have been, okay, the first and second you need, but then we could have stopped that matching first and second and the error term would involve like cubic looking things. Okay, any more questions? Okay, great. All right, so for the next uh, little while, I'm gonna prove this theorem that extends, the statement of which extends from here to
Okay. Um, okay, so the proof is to, uh, as I said, hybridize between these two random variables, the sum of the x's and the sum of the y's. So let me just define like an intermediate random variable, which I'll call wi. On this is going to be y1 plus dot, 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 up to y. I always got to look at my subscripts here. i, apparently, plus x i plus 1 plus dot, 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 plus x n. OK, that's a random variable. OK, so uh, s of x, or s x is which w? Yes, it's W is 0. And SY, therefore, must be WN. OK, so these two random variables that we care about in the theorem are W0 and WN. And we're going to get a beat on them by looking at all these intermediate random variables, WI. All right. OK, so therefore, the thing that we care about is, I mean, the thing that we care about is this. OK, so uh, the expected value of psi of Sx minus the expected value of psi of Sy. OK, it's what you would get by putting in W0 and Wn. So I'm going to use the triangle inequality now and say that's at most the sum is 1, i goes from 1 to n of the expected value of psi of w i minus 1 minus the expected value of psi of w i. OK, because I just erased all the absolute value signs. This would be equality by like telescoping. And so then I wrap everything in absolute value signs and push them in here. OK, so um, okay, now something pleasant happens, right? We're uh, trying to bound this. And we've just bounded it by this sum of something as i goes from 1 to n. And the thing we're trying to bound it by is some constant times beta. And beta is also a sum of some things as i goes from 1 to n. OK, so we're just going to do it term by term. And then that will complete the proof. OK, so in particular, we're going to show will show that uh, this thing is at most, well, I guess, c over uh, 24 times expected value of xi to fourth plus expected value of yi to fourth. OK? OK, so for the rest of the proof, we just fix some i between 1 and n. And we're just going to show this term by term. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is actually use linearity of expectation to just put these two quantities inside the same expectation, which actually is somehow an important step. OK, so this thing here is equal to, uh, well, an absolute value, the expected value of psi of wi minus 1 minus psi of wi. OK, so remember what's going on here. x1 through xn and y1 through yn are all independent random variables. We pick them. Then you define wi, which is this sort of hybrid between them. And uh, so these random variables somehow only differ a little bit. They have most of the same stuff in them. They just sort of differ in what's going on in the ith place. And we want to show that you know, when you apply psi to these two random variables, like you, know, you get two numbers which are not too far apart. OK, more precisely, let me just look at this definition. Uh, this wi minus 1 
is, now again, I will stare to get, make sure I get the indices right. It's a u plus xi. I guess wi minus 1 has more x's in it than wi. And this one is u plus yi, okay, where u is like the other stuff. Um, Okay, great. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's remember that this is the last thing we need to show. It's written in red here because I will now erase the statement of the theorem. Okay, so imagine you, you do this. You, you know, draw x1 through xn, and you get this random variable u, which is sort of like the main term, and then you kind of fiddle with it by adding in one case xi and in the other case yi. By the way, uh, let me point out that u is independent from xi and from yi. Okay, so in fact, you're looking at independent sort of increments, xi and yi. Okay, so you have this nice smooth function, or a C4 function psi, and you're evaluating at, at u, which is like some big number, plus, let's say, perhaps smaller numbers, xi and yi. So this hopefully suggests the use of Deepak? Taylor's, Taylor's theorem. Very good, yes. Uh, okay, so let's recall Taylor's theorem. If we Taylor expand um, psi around, let's say, the outcome u, well, let me state it with numbers first. So Taylor's theorem with numbers would say that for all real numbers u and eta, psi of u plus eta equals, it's going to get a little cumbersome, but we're going to do it. Well, psi of u plus eta times psi prime of u plus a half eta squared psi double prime of u. Let us keep going plus one-sixth eta cubed times triple prime at u. Okay, and now I will, uh, that's going to be where I stop, and now I'm going to have the error term, which you can do in a few different ways, and in particular I'll do this version. It's plus one over 24 eta to the fourth psi quadruple prime at u star, where u star is some mystery number, That's between uh, u and u plus eta. Okay. That's from calculus. Okay, so what we're going to do is just uh, apply that theorem to both of these things. Okay, like imagine you draw the random variables, x1 through xn, y1 through a, uh, an, so now all these u's and xi's are just numbers. So now we'll apply Taylor's theorem to both the pieces. Okay, so therefore, psi of u plus xi is, I'm going to write it out, uh, well, somewhat, Psi of u plus, now xi is playing the role of eta here, psi prime of u plus, let me dot, dot, dot it, uh, plus, let me go to the last term, 1 over 24, psi, some mystery number u star, oh, I dropped a, well, okay, I reversed the order here. Okay, and similarly, psi of u plus yi is psi of u plus yi, psi prime of u plus the quadratic term and the cubic term, and the last term will be, let's say, u star star yi to the fourth. Okay, these u star and u star star may not be the same. 
because you know this number x i and y are different, so who knows? But that's okay. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, great. So now I'll subtract these. And I'll deduce that this difference that I care about, uh, psi wi minus 1 minus psi wi equals, <coughs> okay, now some good things will start to happen. So these will cancel. And then the next thing I'll get is xi minus yi times psi prime at u plus xi squared minus yi squared times psi double prime at u plus a cubic term, psi triple prime at u, plus, okay, let me just write error term for now. Okay, where error term literally means the difference of these two things, but <coughs> I'll get back to you on it. Oh yeah, there's constants, thank you. This will have a half, this will have a sixth, and um, I'll put the one over 24 inside the error term. Thank you. Yeah, they're functions of all sorts of crazy stuff, sure. Let me put a subscript i in there. That'll be, make it safe. Okay, great. Um, let me leave this up because it's still what we want to show. Uh, all right, great. So now that's the actual quantity. Of course, now we're taking the expectation. And when we take the expectation, some good things will happen. Let's see, if we take the expectation here, okay, then uh, we can take the expectation here. Now, psi prime u, who knows what's going on there, but u, I just erased it, u is independent of xi and yi. Okay, so for example, this term is equal to, by independence, expected value of xi minus yi times the expected value of psi prime u. As I said, who knows what's going on with this factor, but this factor is zero. Okay, because by assumption, xi and yi have the same mean, the same first moment. So that goes to zero. Okay, and a similar thing is going to happen here. U is independent of this term, and this term in expectation is zero because x i and y have matching second moments. X i and y have matching third moments. So this whole thing, after you take the expectation, let me just write it. It's just the expectation of the error term. Let me just bring the absolute value to the inside anyway. Okay, it would have been equality if I left the absolute values on the outside. Okay, and this is the point that uh, gets Sankhya's question. You see, you know, uh, if the xi's and the yi's had matching moments up to some r, then we could have Taylor expanded to like distance r plus one and the error term would have involved all the r plus 1 stuff. Or, going in the other direction, if we skip the third moments condition, then just had matching first and second moments, then we would have tailored out to here. But there's something special like about d1 to the first two, right? Yeah. Like, it, it could have until 1 and then the second one would be tailored. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I believe what will happen, though, is the conclusion that you'll get, and maybe we can see as I do this, it will be like a not very interesting conclusion. But yeah, it wouldn't be false. So far, let's just say if x i and y had matching means, we could have just done this one and kept this as an error term. But somehow, uh, as we'll see, um, you know, the, eventually the thing you'll get will look like, you know, if in that case, let's say, if you would stopped your Taylor at degree two, then you get like twos here. And so you get like the sum of the variances as your error, which is not necessarily small. But like as soon as you get up past two, you can do this trick of like taking out a max. I don't know if you remember this calculation. If you assume the random variables are reasonable, you can like take out a max and you'll get like an error term that really is small if all of the 
variables are sort of small compared to their sum. Okay, so actually we're almost done. Uh, oh, we're very almost done. Uh, okay, so this error term is the difference of this thing and this thing, and we have an absolute value around it, so we'll just use the triangle inequality. Now we're not going to be particularly careful for the rest of the proofs. So this is at most uh, well, 1 over 24 times the expected value of, let's say, psi quadruple prime at ui star times xi to fourth plus the same thing, essentially, times yi to fourth. Okay, but finally, our assumption is that psi's fourth derivatives are everywhere bounded by c. So it doesn't matter what point you evaluate them on. This is at most uh, c over 24 times, okay, exactly what we wanted. Any questions? Took a lot less time than I expected, so feel free to ask a couple of questions. Uh, all right, great. Okay, so we did it. We proved the central limit theorem with error bounds. Uh, okay, so let me again say why do I like this uh, proof technique so much? Actually, we didn't even quite get the full central limit theorem or Berry-Essian theorem like normally stated, because once you finally do, let's say, that hack, let's say if you want to get close to some CDF distance, we use that smooth version, and there were some deltas to the one-fifth. Okay, so we lost some factor there, which is a little suboptimal. But as I said, I really like this um, proof because it's very flexible. So the proof technique ex immediately extends to get uh, other situations. So, for example, um, here's an extension. If uh, x1 vector through xn vector and y1 vector through yn vector are independent, let's say, r to the d-valued random variables. Okay, so they're vector-valued random variables now. Uh, Let's say in your test function, psi is now on uh, d dimensions. Let's just say, for simplicity, has bounded third derivatives. Okay, I guess I will not state this theorem totally precisely, but that's just out of laziness rather than the fact that it doesn't work. And uh, I should have also added here, more importantly, uh, that the xi's and yi's have matching let's just say first and second moments. So that means that the expectation of xi vector, which is a vector, is the same as that for y vector. And uh, the second moments, when you have vector valued random variables, are actually the covariance matrix. Okay, so assume that for all i, xi and yi match uh, their means and their covariances, then they're close. So Well, yeah, then uh, sum of xi vector is close to sum of yi vector. Okay, let me not spell out the full details, but it's really exactly the same. Uh, yeah, and the proof is like literally the same proof. You just literally the same proof, except, you know, finally you get psi of something, and you use the d-dimensional Taylor's theorem. Okay, and that's it. So, um, it's good, because if you, you know, look in a normal probability textbook, you know, the proof of central limit theorem is not so bad, but then, like, the proof of the, you know, higher dimensional versions take, like, you know, book chapters. But uh, here, it's really, it's just the same proof. Okay, that was uh, for fun, but now let me say the, the, the extension that I, I want to talk about more which is what brings us back to Boolean functions. <coughs> okay, so this 
theorem was about what you get if you take a bunch of independent random variables and just add them up. And then you could somehow say it's close to a Gaussian or close to a sum of Gaussians. So that's like a linear or degree one central limit theorem. So now I want to move to extension two, which is about a nonlinear central limit theorem or a high degree central limit theorem. Okay? So instead of just adding them up, we're going to apply a polynomial to them. Okay, so this will be, I'm going to state a theorem which is actually slightly wrong, but it'll be convenient to just like state a wrong theorem for a second. And we'll fix it as we go. Okay, so now let F mapping Rn into R be a multilinear polynomial. Okay, the uh, picture you should have in your mind is you should start with like a Boolean function from F, you know, mapping minus 1, 1 to the n into, let's say, the reals. And its Fourier transform, as we saw in lecture one, is just, you can think of it as like a multilinear polynomial. Okay, but now we can imagine taking that multilinear polynomial and interpreting its domain as Rn if we want. It's like the multilinear extension. Uh, okay, so in fact, let me just uh, say, you know, you can write any such f as f of x equals sum over s, some real coefficient cs times a monomial x to the s. Okay, if we had started with f as a Boolean function, and then we probably would have written c sub s as f hat s, but let's just imagine we start with a multilinear polynomial, so we'll call the coefficient c. Um, okay, then, in the setting of the last theorem, Okay, in other words, if x1 through xn and y1 through yn are independent random variables with matching first, second, and third moments, and psi is a C4 functional with bounded fourth derivatives, uh, well, something like this. Uh, the absolute value of expected value of f of x1 through xn, oops, psi of that, Minus the same thing with the y's. Is that most some similar looking thing? So c over 24 times sum i goes from 1 to n of now the expected value of like the derivative of f times xi to the fourth plus the same thing with the y's. Okay, where when I say the derivative of f, I mean exactly what I would mean if, again, f were a function on bits. So let me just say, formally, you can define it for multilinear polynomials, and in fact, it's exactly what you would get if you did the calculus derivative. It's sum over s containing i of cs times, then you knock out i from s. Okay, so this is the theorem I want to prove. I won't because it's slightly wrong, but we'll fix it. Um, but you see, it's exactly the same as the proof we just finished doing if f is just reduces to the previous case if f of x is just the sum function. Okay, because if f is just the sum function, then all of its derivatives, d1, f through dn, f, are just 1. Okay, so this thing goes away, and uh, this is the sum of the yi's, and this is the sum of the xi's, so you get exactly the same previous theorem. Does that make sense? So the setting we're going to have in mind, and this is a setting, uh, how we're going to use this thing to prove uh, let's say the majority of stabilist theorem and some other theorems about hardness of approximation is just when f is a Boolean valued function, 
x1 through xn are bits, plus or minus 1, like they always are, and y1 through yn are Gaussians. Okay, so it's going to say something like, if you take a Boolean function and then you just plug in Gaussians instead of bits, meaning plug it into the multilinear uh, polynomial for the function, then you get some similar distributions. Any question? Okay, so let's just try to prove this theorem, and it'll, as I said, it'll go slightly wrong, but we'll sort of fix things. And the proof is really, truly, again, you know, almost identical to what we did before when this function f was just the sum, x1 plus dot, 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 plus xn. Oh, I shouldn't have even erased this, since we're going to use the exact same letters, but anyway. Um, good, so the proof, let me say sketch, just because I'll skip some of the steps. Um, okay, so we're going to define, again, hybrid random variables. So we're going to define wi. Before it was like the sum of like some of the x's and some of the y's, so this time it's going to be like f applied to like some of the x's and some of the y's. Okay, so it's going to be f applied to y1 through yi and xi plus 1 through xn. Okay, and, you know, what we're trying to figure out now is this thing. So what we're interested in is the expected value of psi of wi minus 1 minus the expected value of wi, okay, an absolute value. Whoa. Sorry, 0 and n. Okay, the w0 version is the one with all x's, and the wn version is the one with all y's. Okay, so now, uh, how are we going to break it up? How are we going to look at this? You see, wi and wi minus 1 only differ on what's going on in the ith coordinate. Okay, so we should naturally break up the function f in terms of like, we should separate out, you know, little xi from it. Okay, and this is something we've seen several times before. For example, in the proof of the Bonami lemma, uh, we'll write f of x, it's just a multilinear polynomial as xi times the polynomial that depends, you know, the xi part, and plus another polynomial that doesn't depend on xi. So we know the part that depends on xi is the derivative, that's the notation we use here, and the other one we like to call e sub i because it's really actually the expectation. Uh, when you sort of do expectation out the ith coordinates, but if you prefer, it's just the sum of the stuff that doesn't contain i. Yeah, I've just taken the multilinear polynomial and pulled out xi. Okay, and uh, notice that these two things, both this DIF and EIF, don't actually depend on the ith coordinate. See, neither of them depends on the ith coordinate. Uh, so they're really just functions of everything except the ith coordinate. So therefore, wi minus 1 is actually, let's say, u plus xi delta, and wi is u plus yi delta, where uh, u is the random variable, this thing, which is common. And since it doesn't depend on the ith variable, you know, I'll just not put it in there. Okay, and uh, delta is basically the derivative at the same thing, which also does not depend on the ith coordinate. Okay, I got this literally just by plugging in the definition of wi here. Okay, so there's this part that's in common, u, and then this is sort of like the derivative, which changes depending on xi. And as before, you see u and delta are independent of xi and yi, which is quite critical.
Okay, so uh, you should really imagine, you know, it's a sketch, so I'm not going to write it out, but we really would just write the exact same proof as before. Uh, we would, you know, telescope this sum into the differences between the adjacent WIs. We use the triangle inequality to sort of show that, you know, since the error also involves a sum, it's enough to depend, uh, to bound each of the differences of the adjacent guys by something that looks like this. And uh, so then we're going to have psi of u plus xi delta and psi of u plus yi delta in this adjacent term. And we'll Taylor expand. And let's say, for example, when we're Taylor expanding, I claim we're going to get all the same cancellations as before. You see in the first Taylor expansion, let's say wi minus 1, we're going to get some stuff. Let me just look at, let's say, the second term. You'll get a half xi delta squared times psi double prime at u. This will get half yi delta squared times psi double prime at u. Okay, and when you subtract them, the same thing will kind of happen. You'll get here a uh, half delta squared psi double prime u squared, oh, not squared, uh, times xi squared minus yi squared. Okay, that'll be the difference of these two terms. And again, you know, u and, and delta both depend on all of the, I, you know, all of the variables other than xi and yi, but they're independent of xi and yi, so in expectation, when we have this, we can use this independence to write it like this, and the xi's and the yi's have matching second moments, so that part drops out. Okay, so everything will be kind of the same. And uh, sort of the final error term, or the ith error term, it's going to be bounded by the c over 24 again times the expected value of, you know, you'll have the fourth derivative here, which is what you're bounding by c, and then this will be the piece that's left over. So xi delta to the fourth plus expected value of yi delta to fourth. So that's how the proof should end. Well, the proof sketch, if we had written the details. But this is where we see that uh, something slightly wrong has happened. Can somebody tell me what it is? Think it over as I erase this board. Very good. Exactly right. So, uh, yeah, what is this delta? Well, in the i sort of step of the telescope, it's this, right? It's the derivative, but applied to like some mixture of like the first little bunch of them are y's and the last bunch of them are x's. So actually, you have a different ith error term here where this delta has like some of the y's built in and some of the x's built in. So that's not what I wrote here. I mean, if this notation, I guess, meant anything, it would be like if I had all the x's and all the y's here. So I guess that would be right for the two, like the first and the last error term, but it's wrong for the middle ones. Uh, everybody get that? So that's a drag. Um, Okay, so one thing you could do is just be like, well, that's it, never mind. I'll just write, you know, this out and like, that's my theorem. So instead of this, you'll have, you know, this x should actually be the first i minus 1 y's and the last, whatever, n minus i x's, and that's that, which you could do. Uh, okay, so a more uh, enjoyable thing to do, I guess, is to say, um, well, in most circumstances, like, we do not leave this as the error term anyway, right? I mean, in the... The very SAN that we did, indeed, we had, you know, some error term that looked like sum of i expected value of xi to the fourth, which was fine. But then we mostly said, okay, why is that even small? Let's assume 
that, you know, xi is B reasonable, which meant that this thing was at most B times sum over I expected value of xi squared squared. And then this is saying something about the second moment, so, you know, that's equal to B times the sum of sigma i squared squared fourth. Okay, and we even said, you know, this is at most B times the max of the sigma i squareds times the sum of the sigma i squareds. Okay, and if that was normalized to one, then this error term was bounded by the max of the variances. Okay, and that made us satisfied, right? We said, you know, if that's a good general scenario, like if you're adding up a bunch of x's, if all of the variances are small, the individual ones, then the error is small. Okay, so we would like to imagine, like, if we're ever going to actually use this theorem, we'd probably try to do something similar to handle the error. And so uh, what's good is that when you do something similar to handle the error, this problem that you have, like, mixes of x and y's actually goes away. Um, okay, so, uh, good. So, well, let's just model ourselves on what happened here. The first thing we assumed was that the xi's were B reasonable so that we could somehow convert this fourth power to the square of a second power. So now... The actual error term we have also has a fourth power. We'd like it to get down to something like the square of the second power. So perhaps this would remind you, therefore, bearing in mind that delta is actually a polynomial, may remind you of the Bonami lemma, right? That it says you have a low degree polynomial of, let's say, bits. Uh, the fourth moment is bounded by some nine to the degree times the square of the second moment. Okay, so. In order to apply that, you're going to have to assume that f is low degree. So let's assume that. It's kind of a safe assumption because so you're going to have to assume something like that because imagine the bits case. If you don't put any bound on the degree of f, then it could be like the parity of all the bits. And like no matter how hard you work, like the parity of a bunch of plus or minus one bits is not going to look like the product of Gaussian. So it's sort of natural that you'll have to look at low degree. So let me sort of make some further assumptions. Let's say, let's suppose that f has degree at most k. And let me specialize a bit too, because we're going to use Bonami's lemma. So let's also assume that x1 through xn, y1 through yn are independent, and they satisfy the hypothesis of, of Bonami. Okay, normally we thought about applying Bonami when it was just uh, plus or minus one bits, but I don't know if you remember when we did it, we actually showed it worked. The only thing we really needed about the random variables were that uh, they had mean zero, second moment one, third moment zero, and the fourth moment at most nine. So we said that xi is nine reasonable. Okay, and similarly for the yi's. Okay, so for example, uh, bits or Gaussians are fine. Okay, and then Bonami's lemma and let me write it on the next board. Um, well, it tells us that the, uh, the fourth norm squared of a fourth moment square, fourth moment of a degree k polynomial is at most the square of the second moment. Okay, so in particular, sorry, I'm jumping from this board to this board. Uh, yeah, it tells us that this thing, the expected value of xi times delta to the fourth, this thing is degree at most k. Okay, it's really just if you take f, uh, I sort of erased it, but like it's the part of f that has an xi in it. Okay, because you like took the derivative with respect to xi, but then you multiplied xi back in. So it's, you know, just some part of f, so it has degree at most a degree of f. Okay, so she tells that this, this is at most expected value of xi times delta 
squared squared times 9 to the k. Okay, and this is despite the fact that this, remember, is dif of x, sorry, y1 through y i minus 1, xi plus 1 through xn. Okay, which has this mixture of y's and xi's, but that's okay. And Bonami, you know, as long as you have all your random variables satisfy these things, they can be, they don't have to be identically distributed. Is that okay? Okay, so, uh, good. Similarly for the y's. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I have a expected value of xi times this delta squared. Forget about this squared for a second. So imagine we were in the first step and all the x's, everything was bits, so this is a bit, and uh, into delta you're plugging bits. Can somebody tell me what this expectation would be then? Mm, no. Yes, that's right. Really? Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's awesome. No, because you see, uh, this is the derivative, right? So, um, so this is sum over, you know, s that contains i of, you know, cs or f hat s times x s with the ith guy taken away, but then we also put the ith guy back in. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. If you have a multilinear polynomial over bits and you take the expectation of that thing squared, you just get the sum of the squares of the coefficients, right? So this expectation is the sum over s that contain i of c s squared. Now, in general, it's not all bits. You have like some mixtures of x's and some y's. But if you remember, see, this is by Parseval. You can possibly remember back to like lecture one how Parseval is proved. You prove it just by like expanding it all out, and you use the fact that you know the expected value of x i is zero and the expected value of x i squared is one, and the random variables are independent. So actually, as long as you have random variables that are independent and satisfy these two properties, Parseval still holds. So even though this stellar derivative has some, like, some x's and some y's in it, when you take its expectation of it squared, you always get this. Okay, and this we may sort of define to be, you know, the influence of i on f squared. Okay, so f actually to start with was just a multilinear polynomial. Okay, so I'll just define the i-th influence of it to be this thing. Okay, and if f came from a Boolean function, then indeed this thing is the influence of that coordinate. But in general, it's just the sum of the squares of the coefficients in f that contain i. We'll call that the influence of i. Okay, and similarly, I mean, it's the exact same thing with this. Uh, you know, still you just have a one yi in there instead of xi, but, uh, you know, parts of all still holds. Okay, so... Uh, the correct conclusion then so this conclusion was kind of wrong um, let's put an x through it we could have written the right conclusion if we had taken care to put all the y's and the xi's mixed here but what we see is under hypothesis star we can say that this is Uh, at most, I guess C over 12, because I'm going to get two copies of the same thing, 9 to the K, sum I goes from 1 to N of the influence of I on F squared. Okay? And actually, I could um, stop there if I wanted, because, you know, that's correct delete this slightly wrong part now. That's correct, and, you know, this is actually a reasonable error term. Uh, to remind you again, the influence is, by definition, we'll say it's this, okay? So it's the sum of the squares, the coefficients that include the ith variable. Uh, although we don't even have to stop there. 
Um, we could still, you know, it's, if you imagine what we did in the simple case of summing, this is like we got up to here. Uh, this is some of the squares of the influences. Okay, so let's also do this step, which in this context would be to pull out one copy of influence with a max. and leave the other copy in there with the sum. Okay. This we could, if we want, you know, call the total influence of F. But in any case, just looking at what it is, in terms of our definition, Uh, this piece, just by taking this definition, it's just like in the Fourier world, this is a sum over all S of cardinality of S times CS squared. Okay, just like in the, the Boolean world. And one thing we can do in this case is we have this assumption that F has degree at most K. Okay, so this cardinality of S is always at most K. And we could have made this not equal to the empty set we get CS squared, and I claim this is equal to K times the variance of F. Well, let me just say that this is the definition of variance of F, but this actually equals the variance of F of X1 through Xn, which is also the same as the variance of F of Y1 through Yn, or any combination, because this fact that variance equals this is again just follows from Parseval, which all you need for it to hold is these facts. So finally, another you know, bound on the error we can put is this uh, C over 12. C is presumably a constant. K times 9 to the K. If F is of constant degree, that's also constant. Times the variance of F. That's sort of a natural scaling factor. And finally, the maximum of the influences. OK, so that's the last thing I'll sort of say. And the final conclusion in words is that if F is a low degree polynomial, multilinear polynomial, and uh, you fix its variance, and all of its influences are small, then the distribution on random variables from what you get if you plug in, let's say, bits versus what happens if you plug in Gaussians is very similar. OK, and this is what we'll use in some future classes to show things like majority of stabilist theorem to transform problems about Boolean functions with small influences into problems about functions on Gaussian space.